Welcome to Beyond the Cast, where real stories meet inspiration. Join us as we dive into the personal journeys of incredible individuals sharing their powerful testimonies. Each episode is a testament to resilience, triumph, and the wisdom gained through life's challenges. Get ready to be inspired, motivated, and empowered. This is Beyond the Cast, where stories come to life and lessons transform. Let's dive in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Beyond the Cast. I am very excited to have a good friend, Rourke Denver. Uh, for people that don't know Rourke, um, he is a author, actor, but for me, he's just an amazing human that we met through a mutual friend of ours, Jim Bergen, through yeah, church. Yeah, yep. But thanks for coming on, bro. No, I'm stoked. I'm glad we could do it. Just to get timing. Yeah, no, for sure. Yep. Well, I'm digging the beard. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you go uh, 20 years in the military and you got to dra- drag a razor across your face, you know, all that time, unless you're on modified grooming standards up in Afghanistan when you don't have to do it anymore. You're like, ah, I think I'll let it run for a little bit. But you, it was longer the last time I saw it. Was, you yeah, August, it was, yeah. It had gotten completely getting... out of hand. Mama was like, come on now. You're also, you're also a professional. At some point, you probably got to keep it that way. And she was probably right. Yeah. So we're going to we're gonna dive into like what you're doing now. But, sure. you know, I th- a big part and in initiative of what we're trying to, you know, do with this podcast is just like tell people's stories. Yeah. So you've done some really cool stuff in your life. Yeah, from the movie Act of Valor. And then you've been on, I know you've been on Meat Eater, but I didn't realize that you were on American Grit. Like yeah. I, I pulled that up too. So that's yeah, pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, but prior to all that, Navy SEAL Commander. Yeah. That's badass. It was a lot of fun. But like kind of going into that, you know, maybe starting back from before military, like did sure. you know that that's what you wanted to do? Or let's hear that story. Yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, you know, I mean, I think everybody, I think most young men that are aggressive and like playing rough and being out of doors probably has at least um, some thought of the military. I mean, I don't know if that's the case. I mean, certainly I saw the first, you know, top gun and then everybody wanted to be in the military. So, you know, all the, all the regular things I would think as a young lion that could drift you towards that probably existed at a young age. I had no plan though. There's lots of military in my life. I mean, my, my um, uncles, both on my mom's side were Navy and air force respectively. My, my dad's dad was killed in the Pacific theater of world war two B 24 liberator guy. So we have lots of military through service throughout the generations, which I've, I've written quite a bit about that, that, that the military has basically become a family affair. I mean, it's very rare that people don't have multiple generations of folks that serve and those folks that don't serve often don't, you know, so it's kind of interesting how much there is that connective tissue, but I really didn't have a plan for that. You know, I, I, I grew up in the Bay area, California, right in the heart of Silicon Valley before you knew that tech boom was going to take place and kind of the insanity of the politics and the way that that part of the world has, has, has shifted. But it was cool because it was very, there's a tremendous amount of intellectual horsepower. There's a lot of creativity in that era. And I think, um, and you know, still is certainly, but I, I think there was something about that as a Petri dish. That was kind of a cool place to marinate in. Cause there's a lot of smart people. My dad's super bright. My mom's very bright. I was very lucky in, in kind of a parental combination. And I, I just hated school. I mean, growing up, I just couldn't stand school. I just felt like I was tethered in a room. I was very intellectually curious. I love to read, you know, I love to read. And, and that's a big part of my, um, you know, certainly my education and, and, and the really only thing that kind of took me to college was sports. So I, I played sports all the way, you know, like every kid in that generation, you played everything, but aquatics, actually water polo, which is a huge California Western sport. And then lacrosse were the two games I played. I thought I was going to stay out West and play water polo. I ended up get, getting recruited to play lacrosse at Syracuse, which is in that era was basically the top, you know, one of the top three Titans, you know, on that landscape. And so, um, I got to play for one of those legendary coach, just like if you'd played for coach K at Duke or, you know, Saban at Alabama truly played for a legend. And, um, yeah, we were in the hunt every year, you know, competing for national championships and winning a couple and, and getting real close every year. And then in the the fall of my senior year, I'm a fine arts major, which is obviously the path to uh, becoming a stone cold killer. I had no <laughs> idea what I wanted to do next. Everybody was going to go down to New York City and get a job. And um, my dad, brother and I love sharing books with each other. And my dad sent me a copy of Winston Churchill's My Early Life, which is an autobiography that great British statesman wrote much later in his life. But it captures about his first 30 years, kind of his young life. And something about that book was just like a like a you know lightning strike to service. That 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 starting my kind of adult life as a um as someone that would serve in the military and then also particularly as a leader. Uh, would be the right path to start. And so I did a bunch of research at that point, read about all the different special operations unit. There's very little about SEALs at that point. I found some chapter in a book that said 70, 80% of the people that show up don't make it. And I was like, that's my spot. You know, I like competing. I like suffering. And so that's what led me to the SEAL teams. And then 
yeah, it ended up being a 20 year career. I did, I did about 14 active duty years. I finished six in the reserve just so I could see that finish line, but none of us knew what we were going to hit. I got a couple years pre nine 11, nine 11 happens when I'm, when I was deployed and boom, we chase bad guys for the next 15 years, you know, just, just hunting evil. So, um, I kind of hit the lottery in my timing. Those of us that really wanted to see the bear and, and go, you know, turn over every stone and that human experience and, and kind of compete, uh, you know, in the toughest arena, we, we got everything we were looking for. And so, um, I feel super lucky in my time. I I'm, I'm healthy physically, mentally, spiritually. I, I, I either had the predisposition or kind of the, the traits that, that, metabolize that all well, or maybe some level of luck. I, I saw plenty of, of horror out there, but I, I sleep like a baby. I've got a great marriage and two, two wonderful kiddos coming up. And I just feel real lucky in my time being part of it. Well, you just literally did like the Rocky workout scene in the movie <laughs> yeah. in a couple minutes, but that's over 25 plus years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, you start with, uh, being in college and just your dad, you know, the education that yes. you had. So there's something about that, the home that you grew up in for sure attested to that. But like, tell me about, was there any part of you? Like, I know you're competitive, but full transparency, when you went into buds, was there any part of you that's like, what did I get myself into? Or were, were there yeah. any of those moments? Yeah, no, quite the opposite, quite the opposite. I, 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 um, I absolutely knew I was home when I showed up there. I mean, from day one, uh, it's brutal and it's brutal till about the day you finish and then get to a team and then it gets real serious. I, I just felt like I'd found my spot. You know, I've told this story before. I don't know if I've ever told it, you know, kind of on air, so to speak, or, you, you know, on camera. Um, when I was at Syracuse, you know, they, they were, per, we were perennial powerhouses. I mean, you, you know, more national championships than anybody in the country. I got to add two while I was there. When I showed up, every player there was a multi-time All-American, the best team, you know, player from their high school, their county, their state. I mean, it was, you know, it was like playing in any premier team where everyone is good. Coming from California, I knew I wasn't getting on the field because of lacrosse talent. I was just like, look, I got to I gotta just outwork everybody. I'm big enough and fast enough to play in Division One, but I, I don't have the experience. So I won about every sprint that was ever run at Syracuse. I'm like, I, I can at least go harder than everybody. And if it was a suicide out and back, you know, 10, 20, 30 times, you were done. I'd start lapping you. I, I, I just went harder than anybody else. And I always wow. liked that and kind of had that in me. I think my dad planned that seed and my brother and I, and my mom's actually a hell of an athlete as well. So I think we had that in, in us. But I remember my freshman year, we're playing the first game of my freshman season. We're ranked number one in the country. North Carolina Tar, Tar Heels are number two, and this is the first opening game of the season, so it counts. We fly down to Chapel Hill to play North Carolina, and uh, Friday before the game on Saturday, we're just doing our practice, practice and warm ups, and kind of staying loose and getting ready. And something we did really pissed off our coach. And like I said, my coach is a Hall of Famer, one of the all time great coaches. Played lacrosse with Jim Brown. I mean, just unbelievable character. And he gets pissed, and he's like, "Everybody on the end line, let's start running sprints." And so we figure it's going to last two, three minutes, and then he's going to cut us loose. And we're probably five, eight minutes, 10 minutes into run sprints. So you can tell the assistant coach is like, hey, coach, like we, we have to play North Carolina tomorrow and defend the number one position. We should probably take a wrap off. Well, I don't care because I know I'm not playing. I'm a freshman. You know, there's, there's all Americans in every position, so I'm probably not going to see the field. So I'm just going as hard as I always go. Coach finally says, hey, I want everybody on the end line. We're going to run everyone all together, all, all three positions are all going to run at once. I'm going to blow the whistle. You're going to run to me at the midline. So about a 50, 60 yard sprint. The first two men, the first two guys to come across the line in each wave, get to go to the locker room. You're done. And I don't want you even to stay here. High five that you want to just go to the locker room, get your stuff off. Hope we play better tomorrow. So now remember every sprint I've run since I've been at the campus at Syracuse, I've won. And I end up in about the last six. And I remember looking around, I'm like, I'm not going to be in the last two. So on the like the you know third to last sprint, he blows the whistle. I run through the line. I remember I come through the line. I'm so upset. I take my helmet off. I kind of throw my helmet down. I regret it the second I do it. You know, here's coach standing there whose dad coached before him. The way he talked about that big S on a Syracuse helmet. I'm like, I pick it up. I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble. I turn around. As soon as I turn around, my coach is standing there right in my face. I was like, I hope I don't play for North Carolina now for throwing that helmet. He's like, no, no. He's like, hey, don't think it's lost on us that you run hard all the time. The only reason these guys ran hard is because they got to be done. You run hard because running hard builds towards something better. You're going to be an all American here. You're going to be a captain. We're going to have a lot of fun over the next four years. Keep running hard. Wow. So think of that moment, right? That's what was kind of in my DNA and I'll, I'll never forget it. I mean, I, I like think about it right now and I can see coach talking to me. 
I showed up at SEAL training. I remember somewhere early on, maybe right after Hell Week was done, class got in trouble and we're running like you and I are both big guys. I'd pick you up my shoulders, run you out to the ocean, drop you in the water. You'd pick me up, run me back. I mean, just horrific physical stuff. But I remember kind of looking right and left and being like, oh, everybody here runs hard all the time. So I just felt like I was home when I was there. I, I really, I never occurred to me to quit. I never had a moment of doubt. Um, not from some arrogant place. I just was like, this is the brotherhood I want to be a part of, and I'm willing to pay the tax to go through it. And I think most people that make it sort of feel that way. And if, know, I, if I'm correct, there are some guys that are doing some pretty big things now that are that were in buzz training with you, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was yeah. it Goggins? Yeah, Go Goggins was a little bit after me in training, but we kind of finished our career in recruiting together, so we got to know each other well. Uh, Jocko was before me because he was um, he was enlisted before he went officer, but then we ended up in Iraq together and in kind of sister units over there. So yeah, some of the some well, most of the legends in the community in that era all were going through training at that point because that was the group that really got the the greatest amount of of you know gunfighting for lack of a better term in the biggest period of time. Right. Well, one of the things like. You meet, I've met a few different SEALs, yeah. but like for you to be able to come out and like be very in tune with like, even just your, your stories are captivating. Mm, man. I love you. listening to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, through when you went, when you actually went into a fight, like a gunfight for the first time, was yeah. that in Afghanistan or was it? Uh, Iraq, really. I or went I to Afghanistan a couple of times, but Iraq is where I had probably my most kind of violent engagements for the biggest period of time. So when it was real, what yeah. was that moment like, if you don't mind me asking? No, I mean, it, it's it's interesting when you talk about it. I feel like it takes a little bit of the, you know, maybe the romance out of it. What, what I found was, um, and it's why I talk so much about it in the kind of corporate environment or the team environment when I'm talking to people, that there's really nothing you can't prepare for. And if you put in the effort and, and, and push your training to a very, very high level, when you get to game time, it'll be more of an afterthought or it'll be more muscle memory than, Oh man, I'm overwhelmed by what's going on. And you, and you see it in great athletes. I mean, the people that work the hardest, I mean, you know, Jordan and Kobe and you know, Peyton Manning, all the, all these greatest players. Usually when you hear people talk about it, they're like, Oh, well he stayed two hours longer than anybody else at practice. He took more shots. He, he, he worked harder out in the gym. And, and that was the SEAL teams. I mean, I think we were so physically prepared and so kind of mentally charged up to go do that job that the first time somebody, you know, jumped up with an AK-47 point at me and started shooting, it, it felt like muscle memory. I'd done all the preparation. I knew how to shoot, move, and communicate. I knew how to react to that. I never felt like I was wanting for training on the battlefield. And then when I got in charge of training, I really tried to drive that home to the young lines and be like, hey, you know, you, you sweat in peace, you won't bleed in war. I mean, you might, but like <laughs> you'll bleed a lot less if you prepare. So we were ready. I mean, more than anything, it was an excitement that we got to finally go play a game, you know, and be, be in the theater. And, um, no, I, 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 I don't really in, in multiple deployments with, with, uh, you know, hundreds of gunfights that, that I got to participate in. I, I don't remember any of them being like, now I'm out over my skis or I, I got my lips barely above water. I felt very composed. Didn't hurt that the people were right and left of me were exceptional performers and knew how to do their job. But um, it's like being on an all American team. Like it is, all, right? Yeah. It was just like, you know, we were ready to play and, and our guys wanted to go to the fight. It's a very different thing. If you went in the military, let's say you're, you know, you're in the national guard or you, you got a job where you're like, look, I want to learn a skill, a mechanic or whatever the position might be. And then all of a sudden you end up in Iraq and Afghanistan, the roads are blowing up and you see your buddies get tore apart. Seals and special operators, like they, they want to go cut the heads off dragons. They, they want to go charge the castle and go, you, you know, do that job. So there was very little of it that I wasn't excited to participate in. And I, I frankly just felt ready and well designed for it. So like one of the things I think about, like all of your training, there's the swimming component. Yeah. You know, and not just swimming, like you're, you have gear. Oh, yeah. And you're like what was like, what was that part of the training for you? Because everyone sees all the cool stuff, the pull-ups yeah, yeah. and all that, but yeah. like the water part. No, the water stuff. Look, if you make it through the first phase of training is where the bulk of the attrition, you know, that 75 to 80% go away. Almost all of that happens real early on with about the first two or three months. And then you get through hell week, which is a very famous week of our training where you're up from Sunday till Friday and you're just wet, cold, and miserable. And it, it kind of, it kind of separates the wheat from the chaff. And any, anybody that was thinking about quitting that hasn't quit at that point, will probably do it that week. About the only other thing after that, that's going to let you not see the finish line is if you get underwater and panic, you know, and you can't handle the stress of that, as I mentioned to you earlier, I played water polo and grew up swimming. So 
water polo, you're basically trying to murder somebody in a pool the whole time anyway and getting forced underwater. And so I felt pretty comfortable in the aquatic stuff. You know, I got big lungs. I can hold my breath for a while. So I, I never felt super stressed. Actually, the water part was sort of almost a, like a downtime for me. The thing that became so funny is back then, you know, SEALs are, are still what is considered the maritime component of special operations. So the Captain Phillips rescue out in the Indian Ocean and all that, all that stuff's going to go to SEALs. If it's a waterborne operation, we're going to get all those operations. Other units trained to it, we're, we're the kind of masters of that environment. The thing that's been funny is that these wars have been in the mountains of Afghanistan, the deserts of Iraq, and I think a lot of other special operations u- units believe we're going to show up in those harsh environments and kind of fall apart. And our guys really excelled. And I just think it's a testament to that over, overwhelming level of, of intense fitness, mental and physical focus, and the ability to solve problems out there and just to adjust. So the thing that's so funny is the water parts become the smallest part of what we do as an organization. And we may shift back to that as the world changes, but technology is blowing by that a little bit too. There's a lot of stuff that underwater drones and things can do in the water that we don't have to do anymore. But I I do think that connection to the sea and the the pitiless nature of that environment is one thing that puts seals in a unique category because you know, like if you're cold, you're a hunter, you and I have spent time on the exact same ridge lines where you're just cold, miserable and hurting. There's a whole different world between being dry cold and being wet cold. Mm -hmm. And if you do wet cold for a large portion of your like, infancy in the military you're like whoop de do if it gets hard up here on a on a ridge line you know if i'm dry i'm good and if i'm wet i'm good so right. it's uh it's kind of that harshest environment that i think becomes this you know sort of forge that creates a really unique group of guys yeah well kind of before we close up on the military yeah. stuff i did in your life and how you speak to companies organizations entities whatever it is you know you really have an ability to and I don't call it your calling or whatever, but to like motivate men. Mm. Right. And obviously younger guys that are, you know, they're making their way, but then even older men, like they they sit down and they're just like in awe of like your ability to do that. So that leadership, obviously I think you had it before. I know you had it before you went into the seals. Oh, for sure. But like, where do you feel like you started identifying that? Because obviously when you came out of the military, you had this pathway of like, I'm going to go do this. I'm not just going to, you know, once you're done, you're going to keep moving forward and motivating people. Where did that spark? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think people ask the, the, the time old question are, you know, is our leaders born or are they made? It's not a cop out. I really do think it's both. I mean, I think you can, you can absolutely apply yourself to the discipline of leadership, seek out those positions, read books on it, pay attention to what works and what doesn't work and make yourself a far better leader than if you didn't put that time in. I do think there is a born component to it. I think it's that sort of X factor or that why people gravitate towards certain people and, and why people don't. And so I think I was lucky in that I had both. Um, I hope that doesn't come across arrogant, but I think, you know, every sports team I was on, I ended up the captain of every, um, you know, kind of group I was a part of. I, I don't think there'd be many people in that group, whether it was a group of friends or at a church group or, you know, any of the boy scouts, whatever I was doing, that wouldn't be like, see me as a leader. And, and usually it's cause I was like, Hey, I'm willing to, I'm willing to take charge or raise my hand and be like, I'll volunteer to go do this. You know, most people shy away from leadership positions. And I think some people kind of have a calling and gravitate towards it. Uh, I do think my kind of literary passion and background, I bet fueled that fire. You know, I love all the ancient stories. I mean, I, I was just upstairs and saw Tolkien on your bookshelf. And so yeah, little hobbit being out there amongst the orcs and the bad people in the world, you know, fighting <laughs> against uh, you know, pure evil. That's the monomyth, right? That those are the great stories that come from whether it's the Bible or North mythology or Greek mythology, these are the great stories and heroes. And I always sort of connected to that archetype. And so I just pursued it as I went through and 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 um I felt very comfortable with it. Right. So yeah. wrapping up the military. Well, I know you were doing so, or you started thinking about your future even before that, right? Yeah. So, like, yeah. how did the whole thing with, uh, you know, some of the reality shows or even the movie yeah. Act of Valor, yeah. how did that come to play? You know, Act of Valor was this very strange, organic, out of left field thing that we didn't know what it was. What it was, even when we were doing it, I don't think we were aware we were filming a real movie. I, I know that sounds absurd. We thought that thing was going to go to a bottom of a DVD bin at Walmart and nobody would ever see it, never see the light of day. It'd be a recruiting film. And it sort of started this recruiting film um, as a project. When they asked us all to do it, we were all on active duty. We all said no. Every single person that participated in that movie said no. 
And then as the gears started moving and it looked like it was going to move forward, we, we got put in a weird position where we actually got put on orders to do that movie. And it's called orders, not invitations in the military. So you're going to do it. But we really wanted to make sure the right guys did it to sort of represent the brand and the brotherhood and to do that right. Uh, but we had no idea what that film, you, you know, I mean, like I said, I thought the thing was going to end up like as a YouTube video. Next thing you know, it's like premiering after the Super Bowl and you're like, this is a real movie and like doing real things. So I have mixed feelings about it. Some part of it, I really like that we tried to tell the story authentically and really talk about, you know, how much we care for our families and the country and why we do the job. I think that came through in the film. And then a bunch of the acts within it were, were events that took place in my time in the military and even to teammates of mine that, that sacrificed themselves for the, their teammates and, and the greater goods. So we tried to play, um, respect and homage to that, which I think was important. But, um, you know, on the flip side of that coin, and I couldn't give it a percentage, but it's close to 50, 50. I have regret about it too. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we really value the kind of quiet professional and doing that. And so there's a component where I think some of us felt like we stepped over the line. I have to be careful not to throw, you know, stones in a glass house. I wrote a few books and I'll probably write more. I like sharing the things I learned. You've read my books. I don't pound my chest and try and talk about myself a bunch. I try and teach lessons, which I, which I feel called to do. Um, and that gave a little bit of a platform as you described to make that exit out of the military. And it made the transition, uh, pretty comfortable for me because an opportunity arose and I was able to grab a hold of it. But, um, no, it was a strange experience to do it. And, uh, I, I think, I think all of us that did it sort of have mixed feelings, but I think that sure. product ended up being great. No, yeah, well, I remember seeing the movie. I, the the draw to me on that movie was that they were actually using active yeah, yeah, military guys, of and course. that's how they promoted it. Yeah, uh, to give yourself some grace, like I'm happy you did it because, like, look what God's done with your life. No, no, since, for sure, for you know? sure. For so, sure. yeah. I get it though. Yeah, I'll yeah. go back and I'll I, watch like one of my first. Now this has no comparison. No, but I, but I get it. I get. Well, look, yeah. people are like, oh, you must. Well, I remember when we made it. Somebody brought up like, um, you know, you're going to be so excited to see it. And I was like, oh, I actually am before you see footage. Then you see yourself and you're like, well, I'll never watch this I'll again. Watch. And you're like, I thought like Johnny Depp and people would be downstairs watching their own movies. And I'm like, I get it. I get why people don't, you know, you hear your voice on the answering machine. You're like, damn, do I sound like that? I thought I had a little bass in my voice, you know? So you see yourself up on a 40 foot screen. You're like, oh, this is torture. But um, no, I, I, I don't regret it. I don't stew on it, but there's, you can, you can imagine the division between there's probably some guys who I respected in the teams that probably like, I can't believe those guys did do it. And, and, may have lost a level of respect, which is a bummer because that wasn't our intent, you know, in doing it. But again, don't lose sleep over it. I, I, uh, I, I don't do a lot of looking back. I like looking forward. Yeah. What's your, uh, in this book, I think you, you signed it onward. Yeah. Yeah. Ever onward. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's 100%. one of your quotes. So yeah, for sure. when did you start writing even before like you wrote your first book? Like I know you yeah. obviously did that, you know, through school or whatnot, but where, yep. where, when did it become serious? Yeah, I'd say um, I say I was always more of a you know literature and kind of history person than a math and science. Numbers are a mystery to me. I actually have a little bit of a learning disability in processing and sequencing numbers, so all that stuff's a challenge to me. It's actually one of the things that appealed to me from Churchill. He had a hard time in math. He got put in re like remedial English classes, and that's why he learned how to write a beautiful, simple declarative statement and became that great orator because of that. So I, f I felt a kinship with that. Um, so I always like to write. I mean, I I I used to grind out. Papers papers in school. And that was about the only thing I enjoyed doing. I didn't do a lot of writing through my time in the military. I have better notes than, than I thought. I also have found a couple almost like little diaries where I wrote every day in seal train. I'm like, man, why I didn't do that for every day for my entire career. I would have such rich, you know, memories and kind of, you know, notes throughout the entire experience. Uh, no, it wasn't really till after, um, right, right about the time I was getting out. There weren't a lot of SEAL books when I started. I mean, it was only Lone Survivor, or American Sniper, maybe one or two others that even come out. And most of those books, no, no disrespect for any teammate, but were about a specific story. Like Marcus's book and Lone Survivor is just really about that unbelievable event and those boys that sacrificed themselves and how he made it um, out of it, which is impossible. You know, American Sniper, one of my teammates in Iraq, it was about, you know, really about these operations and how many, you know, scalps he took and 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 also good ideals. But I really wanted to write one that was much more about the uh, less about a specific mission, set of missions or time and more about the things we learned and valued in our time there. So um, that was the first real dig into serious writing. I worked with a co-writer, which was fun because it kind of helped teach me a little bit more how to do it. Um, the next one I'll certainly, certainly write on my own. The only reason I'd work with somebody else again is just a better researcher or somebody that can help, you know, dig up material that I wouldn't dig up on my own, but no, I enjoy writing and, and I, 
you know, I like a book more than I like a movie, not like I don't like movies, but I, I just really, as I said, a book really kicked off my career. So I hoped when I wrote that one, it might do the same. And I bet 200, 200 young men have told me, you know, I read your book and I'm going to the military and you're like, sweet. That's, awesome. you know, that, that's what it did for me. So, um, you know, you start writing and then speaking happened after that. Is that so, the- sort of on its own, you know, that era nowadays, you know, with, with, kind of online and and people self-publishing the publishing world is I think in disarray because you know books have become uh, they've kind of transitioned to audio books and a lot of different ways to kind of communicate stories um, so I think the publishing world is having a hard time and that era is still very much you wrote a book you went on a book tour to go promote it you, you know interviews and in, at Fox News and in New York City podcasts and go promote that book all around the country I came back from that and an agent at a talent company in Los Angeles that kind of manages people's career was like, Hey, we're getting feedback that like the stories you're telling just as a Barnes and Noble in, you know, Annapolis, Maryland, or like everybody in the room is like, it was 20 people there to see it. Now 80 people are listening to you tell stories. And he said, you know, we could book you as a motivational speaker or a corporate speaker or something like that. And I was like, that's not a thing. There's no way that's actually a thing. And next thing you know, they started booking me for a paycheck that I couldn't like wrap my head around compared to what I'd made in the military. Sure. And I was like, wait a minute, what? I'm going to get on a first class ticket and fly to Dallas, Texas, give an hour long speech. And this is what they pay me. And they're like, yeah, I was like, let's do it. And so it it literally just (laughs) kind of grew that way. And I've enjoyed it more than I thought it would longer, um, longer than I thought I would, you know, you get to kind of cheat into all these little subcultures. It's fun. I mean, one, one weekend I'll be working with a tech firm. Then it'll be a small agricultural firm, it solutions company, you know, linemen putting up power lines and, and, and all that stuff. So it's fun that you do get to hit these different, peer groups and kind of see what they value. And and I think the lessons you learn or I learned in the military, they're, you know, they're, they're eternal lessons. They're they're things that come out of all the great books that have ever been written and all the great stories. So um, I think that's why it resonates with people because they can also see, Hey, well, my leadership isn't going to have the exact same result. You're like, don't, don't focus on that. The principles all work the same, you know, whether you're doing it on a battlefield or you're doing it in a boardroom. So um, I've enjoyed it. That's one of the things that I, I I think a big part of your success is that just not through the military, but now hearing your background with school, I didn't realize that you were such a smart, intelligent guy (laughs) at the school level. I've seen it grow. Like I've seen it grow. I've seen, you know, and, but I, I think that when you could, at the end of the day, we're all just people. So whether you're talking to linemen whether you're talking to, you know, yeah. whatever it is, agricultural groups, or you're on a show like Ranella's, yeah, you know, yeah. doing the hunting stuff, yeah. all that, or even at church, right? Yeah. It translates over. And I think that there are, there's rank in military, yeah. but there, there is rank in life. Oh, no Whether doubt. people want to accept it yeah, or not. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, you're definitely on that higher general oh, no. realm because, well, when, when people, when you speak, people listen. And that's where I think... I want to know what was the first thing that you spoke about on your first speaking engagement? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll back up right before that, which I think okay. is is something that 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 I'll, I'll share with anybody because it was just such gold for me. I don't know if you know the name Hugh Hewitt, but Hugh Hewitt is um, conservative afternoon talk radio. Many many years on on radio shows, he he actually was one of the moderators. People would recognize him, one of the moderators in the early first round of Trump's going through the Republican you know lineup to get the nomination. Um, brilliant guy, conservative thinker, um, believer, phenomenal, phenomenal man. A buddy of mine married his daughter, F-18 pilot, married his daughter. That's how I got to know Hugh. Got got to just kind of you know take him on and ask him to be a mentor. And I remember when I was getting ready to do my first five speaking events. It's exactly like I described, right? Sports executives one day. I've got an ag firm, tech firm, and literally I have one that I'm going to be talking to like Raytheon, so rocket scientists. And I kind of asked Hugh, I said, hey, how do I, because he's a phenomenal speaker. I'm like, how do I you know, how do I kind of um, customize or tailor these for each group? And he's like, don't do that. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, look, you go talk rocket scientists, rocket science to a bunch of rocket scientists, you'll be the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> you talk about what you know, you'll be fine. Literally the best piece of advice I ever got on speaking is stay in, in the lane that you know. You know, be very careful about getting outside your lane. I did one last week and they wanted me to talk about AI. And I literally Googled AI and was like, okay, here's how I can tell stories that mean something to me that I think would relate to AI. The last person you want to hear about the actual nuances of AI is me. So um, I think the first, you know, first couple times I did, I was definitely trying to find myself. What, what, I, what I definitely figured out early on, which is why I think it's had sustained success, is I don't, um, 
I don't use, you know, bar graphs or pie charts or try and teach very specific lessons. I tell stories. And so I'll tell a story. That story will have a tangible, very easy to grab a hold of takeaway. And then I let you do with it what you will. The thing that's cool about it is I'll have people reach out to me and be like, hey, that, you know, that concept of uh, reach for an inch or try and just do a little bit more, which is, you know, something I've been telling for 10 some odd years. They're like, I use that with my team is incredible. I get just as much satisfaction when somebody says, you know, I've been pushing it to try and get better at X, Y, Z, losing weight, working out, whatever it might be. I just realized if I go one more inch, I might get better. I've gotten better. Or I did this with my kids or a Boy Scout troop and it really worked. And that that's where it's fun because I think by not beating a drum of this is what I mean and this is what you should do with it, I, I just let it sit out there and you take it for what you want to take. Because we've all had this experience where, you know, you listen to a pastor or a sermon or a speech or a talk and, and what one person takes out of it, you might take the opposite out of it. That's ah, good either way, you know, for sure. So, right. yeah. yeah. So I tell stories and, and, and so I I've done that from the beginning, just try and tell a story with a takeaway and I let people run with it. I, I just feel like that from, you know, the, the, the grandfather, you know, war chief sitting around his Indian um, campfire telling the grandchildren stories of, you know, the great spirit or, or, you know, the Buffalo or things like that. It teaches these lessons that are super important. And because the story's good, you remember. Them. Well, I like that in, in a few of the times that I've heard you speak, you definitely talk about like, you know, the frontier, uh, you know, you talk about Indian native culture, all that yeah, kind of yeah, stuff. So, yeah. which I get, you know, let's talk about hunting a little bit. Is that sure. something that you grew up doing or no, so I, I mean, I guess a little bit. My dad's an avid fly fisherman, so my brother and I started fly fishing before we ever threw a spinning rig or a, a worm with a bobber anywhere. You know, I think in California, in California. So a lot of the great, you know, freestone creeks and trout streams up in Northern California, the the Trinity and the Klamath and the um, you know the Sacramento, these great you know steelhead salmon and, and trout streams. And so yeah, we we grew up fly fishing our whole life. It's something we do to this day. I mean, my dad's eighty, he, about to turn eighty. He still practices law. Um, he's been practicing law as long as I've been alive, sharp as a whip, physically fit. We're up in the Canadian Rockies fishing for trout this past fall with my brother. And you're just like, what a gift, what a gift to have this time, you, you know, with him and my, my brother, who's, you know, we've been thick as thieves since day one, never really fought each other and just been great partners in crime. And so, um, you know, fly fishing is a lot more like hunting than other forms of fishing, you know, whether it's sight casting or really kind of putting a plan together on how you're going to attack a piece of water and pick apart that terrain. So I guess a little bit of that. Um, but no, I mean, I shot a little bit plinking, shooting at cans and stuff, 22s and stuff like you will with, with outdoor, you know, dads and uncles, but never, never hunting. It just wasn't something that anybody in my family line really did seriously. And so when I came out of the military, I, well, I hunted bat two legged critters for the next 15 years. And then I came out of the military. I was doing a little bit of consulting with SOG knives. SOG was a, um, was Steve Ranella's sponsor at that point. And somebody from SOG was like, these two guys have to meet, man. Like the way Steve tells stories and reads and writes, we got to put these guys together. So we met out at shot show together. I don't know, eight, nine years ago. Now um, we hit it off. We had a lot of fun giving a speech to, you know, some clients and kind of industry folks. And he said, have you ever been on a big game hunt? I was like, I, you know, I haven't, I've been chasing Al Qaeda and he's like, let's uh, let's do that. So we go up on a bear hunt to the Alaska range and you're like, I mean, talk about jumping the string, you know, to the head of the hunting line. Your first hunt is with Renella on the meat eater in the Alaska range, hunting a predator, you know, in wild country. And it just, I mean, I was a hunter from that point on. And, and now I've hunted, you know, as much as anybody chases it here around the world. I mean, I'm fanatical about it. If I, I, I you and I have discussed it, you know, I, I yeah. would say at some point I probably should just do a show cause I love it so much. I probably gotta get my kiddos out of the house. So I'm not traveling as much as Steve and you guys will, but, um, I just love it. I mean, it just is, uh, what it's is like, it about it that you love? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of things. Everybody that tries to answer this question probably attacks a lot of the same things and then probably attacks different things. I think for me, um, you know, the literature that's been written about how good it is to be outdoors and in wild places and out away from your phone and focused on something, that's beyond reproach. I mean, everybody knows if you just got outside more and played in your backyard, you'd be better for it. Take your shoes off, walk in the grass, be in the sand, go do something fun. So that that part of it, I love. I like being out in the quiet. I'm, I'm as much as I do social things for my job. I'm pretty introverted. I think we've talked about that. I, I, I go a long time without talking to anybody. Every once in a while, my bride will be like, "You need to go, like, say hi to a friend or something," because you'll get quiet and start reading and be off in your own world. And I, and I need that time as well. Um, but something about that time in the field is is very, very special for me. It's, it's, 
it's almost like church, you know, it just really is a reset and kind of being out in wild country. When it comes to the actual hunt, I just think the tactics and the, you know, the connection to your food source and being out in that country and, you know, the, the radical, I mean, what people don't know, so many people don't know about hunting is the extreme highs and lows of, of, of failure and defeat and success and, the, you know, gratitude of that time being out there and, and, and kind of pitting yourself against, you know, frankly, a worthy adversary. I like to compete, you know, I've been a competitor my whole life. And frankly, anybody that's ever hunted an elk or a turkey, you're competing, man. And so I just think it's this high level of competition in a very special environment where I get to connect to where my food comes from and commune with nature and what God created in this world, what I just think is like, you're out in it. It's just mad. I get choked up thinking about it. You know what I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, Love but it. you just get out and you just see the, the change of the seasons and you feel it and smell it. And, um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a gift. I mean, I, I it's, it's so beyond, I mean, look, if I get something, I'm excited. If I don't get something, I'm excited. I just like being out there doing it. You know, and I just, I just take, I also think there's, I think some people fight super hard in answering that question to try and justify it. You know, they try and justify, well, it's this or that. I don't do that. Yeah. Look, I don't trouble somebody else about their choices for the most part. If it doesn't hurt me or doesn't hurt somebody around me, knock yourself out. That's what you're into. You want to dress up like a, you know, animal or, or play games and be on video line. Look, there's somebody that's playing a video game that probably has just as much passion for that as you and I do for being out in the, the wilds. We could probably argue what's healthy or not. Um, I don't try and justify it. I love it. And right. It's, it's as much who I am as, as something I do. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I think it's, uh, your background and being in the military and probably some of the, you hear the stories of guys that come back and then there's the, there's the haters where there's the people that are protesting against yep, it yep. saying, well, what did you do? Yeah. Right. I did my job. Right. I did what's, right. you know, what I was born and, you know, trained to do for sure. And hunting, Obviously, it's not to that severity, but hunting's been around since the beginning of time. Yeah, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't. So. Right. Yeah, well, yeah. if you're here, I think it's yeah. uh, Donnie Vincent. He said someone in your family was a good hunter. <laughs> that's right. That's you, exactly yeah, right. If you're, yeah. I think he said if you're the yeah. president of PETA, yeah. someone in your family that's right. was that's a great right. hunter. For so sure, for sure. I, no. I love that hunting brings, sorry, real quick, that yeah. it brings yeah. tears to your eyes because that passion, it does for me too. Yeah, I remember yeah. when we shot bows together, we need to do a hunt. We've been oh, talking about it. We so gotta, overdue. Yeah, for we, sure. We got to plan something. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I think that, uh, you know, what some of the things that, you know, what do you feel like, I guess there's a correlation though, too, because I've heard you talk about hunting and military when you were telling me about this cow that you just harvested yeah, in yeah. Wyoming, yeah. you know, that you took there, the way that you think you still kind of, you treat it like a mission a little oh, bit. Oh, big time, big time. Yeah. I, I said it, um, to, to Steve on our, on our hunt, you know, that got broken into two episodes. It's funny you bring that up because I hadn't seen Steve in quite a while. He was in, in, in uh, Colorado. I saw him recently. And then, um, my daughters, because of some conversation said they hadn't seen that episode with me and it's two episodes in one of the earlier seasons of meteor. And so they watched the episode. I totally forgot about it. And I came into the room as they're watching. It. it was right when I was actually telling Steve, I was like, you know, for the last 12 years, every time I've had a backpack and a gun on my shoulder, I've been in charge. Like, I'm excited you're in charge of dealing with the stress of finding a bear. Like, I can just get to kick back and enjoy it. To back up off that, the thing that instantly appealed to me is when, you know, Giannis sent me, like, the gear list and kind of a grid location of where we're going to be at. Now, all of a sudden, I'm packing gear. I'm unpacking gear to repack it. Can I get rid of this? Do I have everything I need? Now, I'm pouring over maps. I'm looking at the weather. I'm looking at what the moon cycle is going to be doing. And then we get up there, and then I just really tried to absorb everything from a hunter that has as much experience as Steve. Um, and that, that's another real blessing for me. I've had people like Steve, you, people I consider to be world-class hunters that will tell me things about hunting. I'm like, Oh, that goes into my toolbox. Like I'm a constant learner. And I, you know, I love, I love learning and adapting and kind of acquiring new knowledge. And you know, the thing that we touch on when it comes to hunting is again, it's one of those places where great stories surface, right? Like you sit around a campfire with a hunter, a cop, a military guy, there's gonna be no shortage of stories, comedy, things that are happening and folly that take place and highs and lows and all that stuff. And just these great lessons about patience and about, you know, disappointment and, and success, all these things live in the most, you know, valued hunt and the simplest bird hunt where it doesn't really matter if you get something or not, you know what I mean? So they all live there. Um, but something very much from my last life translates, you know, directly into hunting. So I do see an animal like that as a target and okay, how am I going to use terrain, wind, all this stuff to my advantage? And yeah, it doesn't hurt to have done my last job. I mean, I, I'd say my first hunt, I didn't really come into it as my first hunt, you know, it was just a new, a new target. 
But I've heard that the target when you're hunting is a lot harder than humans. Oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> you can pattern a human and their, their stupid behavior pretty easy. You try and figure out what a turkey's doing on a ridge line. You're like, how is this thing with a brain this big beat me like for an entire season? You know? So it's uh, yeah, I love it. I, I always made it. the yeah. joke that if I you know, if I was ever an elk, I'd be, you know, the little raghorn sitting in someone's like, yeah. side, like, I don't even think I'd be in someone's garage. Yeah. I'd be on the side. Cause yeah. you know, you, you hear the girls cover, you'd be yeah, running into exactly. a bar and just yeah, get yeah, shot. For sure. Yeah. They'd be done <laughs> real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so with, uh, want to talk about your faith. We obviously, you know, go to the same church and we, you know, we've talked about Jim. He brought us, uh, or he brought us the connection of hanging yeah. out and all that, yeah. but is that something that you grew up in California with, like with your yeah, family? Yeah, I'd, I'd say I've had, uh, I, I mean, I actually, I would bet if I really talked to a lot of people, it's a very common path. I grew up in the church and and probably with one parent. So my, my dad grew up in Brooklyn, real kind of rough part of Brooklyn, um, went up, went to Catholic school and literally had the nuns like beating him and whipping them for, you know, not being good kids, you know, so he's like, this is not for me. So it's never a path that he, he really uh, kind of connected with. And you can imagine if nuns were wrapping your knuckles with rulers and things like that, you'd be like, I'm not sure this is what it's supposed to be. So he didn't have a big calling or feel to that. My mom um, grew up in the church. And so we went to an Episcopal church, which is, you know, like the Protestant version of Catholicism, right? Knees, communion every weekend, fire and brimstone, everybody's damned. I mean, you sort of live that life as a young person, like, this is rough, man. Like, I'm, I can't do anything right. You know, so there's some there's some part of, of church in my young life that you're like, this is intense. I did feel like I had a good faith and belief that this wasn't all by accident, that there's something out there that, that you know, a creator or a greater control of, of the universe in our lives. Went to college, got away from it. I didn't go to church much in college other than when I was home. And then it really wasn't until I got married and, you know, my bride grew up in the church, small town, Kentucky, where, where you know, that that's a big part of people's lives in the in the South and in kind of country parts of the world. And, and she and I really started to go back to it. And then I think my time in combat moved an interesting needle. I, I, they kind of talk about how there's no, you know, atheists in foxholes. I didn't experience that. Um... I would think your listeners would handle this. I don't tell this story much, but um, we'll give it a shot because I don't think you'll you'll be unhappy with it. No. The first time I saw somebody that was shot on the battlefield, a bad guy in particular was shot with a lot of trauma to their head. Let's just not make it as graphic, the most graphic I can make it. I remember when after the gunfight was over, when I walked up on that body, when you know the head gets kind of compromised, right? The structure gets compromised. That looked more like a clown suit than any like being I'd ever seen. It, it just was like a Hollywood special effects artist couldn't make a dummy that looked less real than the person who had been a person minutes before looked like. I'd never had a more like stamp on the idea of the soul, and that something animates this like, you know, as Rogan talks about this meat sack, that's just sinew and tissue and blood and all this stuff that that's not who we are. This is just the vessel we're inhabiting for right now. So there's something very intense about seeing that where I was like, man, whatever was there before this happened is not there now and has moved on. And so then trying to, you know, kind of rectify that. I think Christendom is the best set of principles that kind of rectify that and explain that story and history. I think the principles are the best. I think, it's beyond reproach. I think if, look, you don't have to be a devout Christian in my mind to read that book and be like, you can't, there's nothing in there that's wrong. Right. I mean, you want to argue we shouldn't take care of the orphans or not covet what other people have or, or, you know, treat others as you wish to be treated and, you know, be willing to sacrifice yourself for other. I'd be like, yeah, those are all good principles. So, I mean, if you lived it, even not believing it, you'd live a better life than if you didn't live it. Like that's, beyond reproach. Right. And so I think, um, I actually think finding flat irons and, and, and before that in San Diego, a little bit uh, progressive is not the right word, but you know, what I mean? like a newer church where you're like, man, here's a pastor sitting up there talking about stories that connect to me. It's not just fire and brimstone and you're damned. And you, you know, you gotta be dressed up nice every day in a suit and tie. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not disrespected, but you know, you come to a place where people got tattoos all over them and you, know, some people have really wrestled with some very, very challenging things and tough things. And I think frankly, everyone has a story and probably a, a bunch of, of pain and history and toughness that most people are unaware of. And if you kind of start from that point and then see a bunch of people that are kind of, uh, you know, if nothing else, working towards grace and trying to be a better person, that's pretty easy to get behind. So I think, um, I think my modern connection to my faith or my more, more, you know, current connection, to my faith is much healthier and, 
and more natural than it was, you know, growing up in the church, which I think is very tough to do as a young person. Well, one of the things that I always go back to is that like, and I've, I've heard this from other guys in the military, but when you're going into a fight, regardless of what your brother next to you yep. to the left or the right, you it, it's, it's all for one. Yeah. 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 You have to be a unit regardless of what they believe, regardless of what you believe. For sure. But like, you know, like that at that point, it's on a different level. It's probably, I would, I would venture to say spiritual. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a connection that's beyond the training. No question. Like, you know, you see the movie Act of Valor, you see any military where they tap them on the back and they move or whatever. Oh, yeah, man. You got to trust that that's person right. with your life. Yeah. So, like, we're that had to elevate your level of spirituality, too, in the way that you think about it. Yeah, no, you know? I, I, I think all that stuff, you know, plays on on kind of your experience in the world. And those are sublime relationships, just like you described. I mean, I, I uh, a teammate of mine that we were on the East Coast together pre-9-11 he now lives abroad. He's done very well financially, but he's just a, you know, he's, he's the best. He's married, no kids, surfing in Indonesia, building homes out there and just goofing <laughs> off. But, you know, he's done all the service levels to have earned that part of his life. But he sent a picture of him and it's kind of silhouetted on this like sunset with a, with a surf line behind him, just the silhouette of him. I'm like, I know that be like as well as I know any of my family members. Like I could see him walking in the darkness at, like coming out of Bronco stadium, it, it literally, if it like the lights went out, I'd be like, Oh, there's my boy. Cause like, you just get, you, you become so aware of everybody's movements and their, you know, their smell and their, 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 their you know, every intimate part of kind of who they are. It's, it, it's very intense relationships with those people. And it does elevate this kind of, uh, I don't know, connection to something special and greater for sure. Well, and then not just talking about the, you know, the military side, you got married, you have, you have children. Yeah. Yeah. That that adds a value to it too, right? Big like time. when so you've gone into all these gunfights and you know, you've served and you've just been in some crazy places and some situations. But for you, when you had kids, did that change? Uh, like as far as like maybe that drive willing to run towards the Yeah, um, I'd say yes and no. I mean, I think I think being a parent is is fascinating in that it's it's the only thing that I've ever seen where all the cliches are true. Right. Like everything everybody tells you about it. You're like, most people tell you about something. You're like, nah, that wasn't how it worked. The parenting thing it is like, you never knew how much you're going to love someone, how much you change the priorities in your life, what you're willing to sacrifice on their behalf, how much you want to help them become this great version of them. So like all those things are totally true with kiddos. Um, I think for me, I have daughters. So I, I, it's, it's to me, for me, and you might have the exact same feeling because of what you're modeling as a man for a young man, I feel an extra pressure in that I know my daughters are looking at me as an archetype of a man. Now, I, I think I'm doing a good job and right by that. That being said, it puts an extra level of pressure. I'm like, look, if I don't handle this well or I overplay my hand here, am I going to like screw her up for life? You know, which which I don't think that's how that works either. I mean, what our kids know is how much we love them. And we also have a tremendous amount of respect in our family. But it's a real a, feeling. It's a real feeling. Man. And you've yeah. led men and now yeah. you're leading yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating tension, too, because um, I do think the world's going a weird path. I mean, I think there's an assault or at least a drift of what a man was. And now there's a vision of what it is now. And I don't think that will be good for our society. I don't think it's beards and strength and toughness and, and grit and being able out to being able to go out into the world and cut your own path. And and so I think a, a classic manhood view is under assault. And I find myself with my daughters saying, I, I really want them to truly know who I am. You know, like I, I don't drink. I've never drop, drank a drop of alcohol. I don't do any drugs. I do like cigars occasionally, not a ton. I don't smoke them like Churchill, but I'll have them every once in a while. And I remember we had a party one time where they were coming home. I was smoking a cigar and they're coming home. And like, I should put this away. And I'm like, wait, I want them to know me. I want them to know me. And we can have the conversation when they get to their choice and be like, well, you do it. I'm like, well, let me explain what I do and how that relates to my body and changing my physio, all that stuff. But I, I really want them to know me. So I, I feel like my bride and I during COVID had had a pretty unbelievable experience in kind of relooking our relationship a little bit. Not not a negative blow up. It was much more the life we live when we were in the military was very isolated. I focused on my job and the mission doing that. She focused on kind of running the house and taking care of things so I don't have to be burdened by that. And consequently, we were kind of living in a place where we weren't working together. And it wasn't, it wasn't, nobody else would have seen that. But I think during COVID, it was very interesting being around each other a bunch where it was, she really is the one that picked it up. She's like, we don't need to do this apart anymore. She's like, you have a super intense personality. I do go to very dark places from time to time. I think that's part of the genetic coding that goes into being a warrior. 
and I can, I, you know, I can get depressed or down. And she's like, you don't need to do that on your own. You can share that with me. And she's like, I do the same things and I'm not sharing them with you. Cause I'm worried it's going to bang up you and you can handle anything. I'm going to throw at you. You've handled things that nobody would ever be able to handle. And so we're much more of a partnership than we've ever been. And that going into the way we look at our kids has just been off the charts, man. Just been off the charts. That's awesome. Yeah. What, what would you, uh, what's some maybe, uh, advice that you would give maybe other couples that are going through that type of situation as far as, so you said she called it out yeah. on this one, but yeah. you, you're constantly the one leading, like what would be your advice to a man yeah, or someone in a relationship? I, just, I think, um, I just think we have self-imposed pressures, particularly as men, you know, either being a breadwinner or whatever that situation looks like. And, you know, men are stoic, I think, by nature. I mean, maybe it's getting less the case anymore with people talk about their feelings, at least the classic guys I know. They're not going to share a bunch of that. I try and be good about that. And some of that I learned in the SEAL teams. I, I remember the, just right before we get back to that with my bride, I, I, I remember one of my good SEAL teammates, a sniper and a legend in our community. We're both retired now. He lives up in Wyoming still today, one of my best friends. He was in my wedding. I was in his wedding. I remember he was with me doing something and I had a bunch of my college friends and some other like kind of current friends, non-military guys. He and I went to say bye to each other. We always do kind of like a Viking handshake. You know, we do that. And he's like, Hey, love you, brother. And I was like, love you too. And he takes off. And I remember a couple of the, like one of my guys was like, did you just tell him you loved him? And I was like, yeah. He's like, do you tell like your boys that you love them? I was like, not all of them, but I should, but I do with them. And he's like, why is that? I was like, cause I, there's a real good chance I won't see him again. Cause we lived in this life where like, when you said bye to a teammate, that could very well be the last time you see him. Yeah. But look, that's all of us. I might say goodbye to you right now. And that'd be the last time. Hope not unlikely the case, but it kind of does put this place where you're just like, you know what? I should be better about that. I should tell people what I think about them. I, I've, I've got an idea for a book. I won't totally let it out, but I, I've, I've written a couple letters recently to people that uh, meant a lot to me in my life and just really was like, I want you to know what happened. I, someone passed that, that I, I regret that I didn't get some, some, some of that too. You know, I didn't tell them how I felt. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. So I, I just think, you know, come up with some way when it comes to your lady. I think every once in a while you got to like, just take a, a, you know, back off the line, right? In a gunfight, when we talk about young officers and we're like, Hey, your job is not to be shooting. Your job is to back off the line and manage the entire mission and situation. So people can just focus on their gun, but you can move the troops as a necessary on the, on the chessboard. And I think we don't do that enough as like in our relationships, our family, and in particular with the person we're in the foxhole with for our whole life. I think back off the line a little bit, take a look at it and, you know, write a nice letter that maybe says more than you normally would on a regular, you know, Valentine's day, um, share who you are. I mean, I think just being super authentic and truthful about who you are and look, if there's something you're not getting ask for it, it, it I think if you've got a good relationship, if you ask for the thing you need, you're probably going to get it. And that's, that's a big thing. She's done more in our relationship. I'm probably getting better at it. I, I don't think I feel like I have as many needs, not, not as, as a woman, but just like I'm doing a lot of the things I really want to do, but she'll ask for something now. And she'll like, even to this day, she'll be like, man, I used to not want to say that. And she's like, every time I bring it to you, of course you like acquiesce to it or support it. And this is awesome. I'm like, it is awesome. Now I like, cause look, it's just like kids are a, are a gun dog. Like anybody that knows what their expectation is, does better. Like you see dogs that are like disciplined. You're like, Oh, somebody had to be hard on that. I'm like, no, that dog knows what's expected of it. That's a better life for that dog. His dog is like, I don't know whether to shit or piss in the corner or not like bark or bark. And so I think asking for what you need is a pretty big move, man. Not many people do it. Well, a couple things. So even asking for what you need, even if you don't get it. Yeah. Right. Because I could ask for a lot of things. Oh, <laughs> no, I for sure. Get. For sure. But yeah. at least having that transparent conversation. Yeah. The other thing that you talked about, and there's a ex so uh, an exercise that I just saw in a reality series. I think it's called... Um, special forces where they get celebrities okay. to kind of go through yeah, it's a reality yeah, series yeah, course, and, they, and, and elimination process. One of the exercises they did, and I think Bodie Miller was like season two, like there, it was like him, Tara Reed and some other people, she fell out pretty quick, but the people that made it to like round two or three, they had to write a letter mm. kind of like what military guys do. Like when they're going, going into a fight yeah, yeah. to their families, Oh yeah, like, Hey, this is my obituary or yeah, this, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm yeah. saying goodbye. Yeah. And I've heard it now already like three times where they're putting that into like, you know, some of these men's groups or whatever, where they can be better. Yeah. What do you think the power of that is? I, I know for me, but like, yeah. what do you think? Like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's 
I don't think there's mystery to it. I think it's saying some of those things like, look, if you weren't going to be able to say something again, what would you say? If you were going to say a last thing, it'd probably be a lot different than the regular, like dropping your kid off at basketball. It'd be something cutting more to the core and the bigger ideals and the things that are really important. It's funny you bring that up. I, um, when we were making Act of Valor, um, you know the movie, but the end of the movie, there's a poem from Tecumseh about, you know, improving your life and, and being a warrior and being a good steward of your people. And the director asked me if I'd ever written one of those letters. We call them a death letter. You ever write a death letter? And I was like, I didn't because I have just enough like superstition in me that I was like, I don't want to write one and have it become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Better than that, I also felt like I tell my dad I, I love him. I tell my brother I love him. That's all we're we're kind of loving and open that way. I think my my bride and I have much more increased our relationship. But if I had been killed in combat, she would have never been like in question that I loved her or not. So I didn't feel like there was a lot I hadn't said. So I kind of said, I haven't written one of those. He's like, well, if you did write one, what would it be? And I kind of pulled that Tecumseh poem out because one, it's just gorgeous and it'd be very hard to beat that on, you know, life well lived or how to be um, a warrior. But I, in my first book, I wrote sort of a little one to my girls very early on as a father on, on, on things that I thought was important for them. But no, I think it's a, it's a good drill. I think yeah. that'd be a great do drill is to write that. I've, I've thought about that with my, you know, my brother and I were up on this fishing trip with my, my dad, like I said, he's 80, he's fit as can be. I mean, he's, he's a horse. He's an absolute like inspiration, but we've got less fish and trout trips in front of us than we have behind us, you know, in, in his eighties. And uh, I, it occurred to me, he had one of his mentors um, pass in, in a law firm that he'd worked with for many years. And this guy was a legend in Northern California. I mean, like a thousand people attended his funeral and it's like, everybody said all these nice things at the funeral. And you're like, look, hopefully he's hearing that, but you can't be sure he's hearing it. And you could say that to somebody now. And I think if you did that, it'd go a long way. You no, know, for sure. Yeah. Well, Kind of going back to the whole storytelling thing and and your ability to lead, I think that there's a lot of, I do feel like masculinity, being a man, that is under attack. Yeah. Like, or for a lot of people, it's in question, right? Depending, you know, you and I yeah, see eye yeah. to eye in a lot of things. Yeah. But uh, for for that, like, what would be your challenge? Because you're not in the military now, but you are leading. You are in a place where you're leading and, and you're, well, creating inspiration, right? And you're a great storyteller, but... What do you feel like you would put that out for any of the guys that are listening to this now questioning, you know, am I screwing this up? What's going to be my next path? And they just don't know. Like yeah. you and I had a conversation, so I'll throw my, I'll be vulnerable. Like about five years ago, prior to COVID, I've always had a lot of great ideas mm. and I do it well executing for others. Yeah. But at some point you got to start thinking about yourself and yes. what's that, you know, it's part of this whole new thing that we're doing here and trying to like, I know great people that have great stories and the, the ability to connect with people. That's something that I yeah. do well. So it's like, how do you get over that hurdle? Like yeah. what would be some advice there? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think that's the, you know, that's the ultimate and what you want to try and pass on to somebody. I mean, I, I, I think, I think we all know better than we know than we usually do, right? Like we all, I think not we all, but I think most people know the right thing to do. They often just don't do it because they know the right thing to do is usually the hard thing. Like suffering and hardship is where the learning is. That's where the good stuff is. I think when people see, you know, that great line, the pursuit of happiness, I think people mistake it. They focus on the happiness part. It's not the happiness is the pursuit. That's what's going to lead to it. Nobody celebrates doing something easy. You celebrate doing something hard. That's why hunting appeals to us so much. You do this hard. Sometimes you just get blown off that mountain and you totally fail. And you still look back at it fondly and want to go do it again to get that success. You know, um, a golfer would understand, you know, you hit a lot of bad shots. You hit one good one. And you're like, oh, it's going to keep me coming back for more and try and perfect that. Um, I think people need to be like the author of their own life. I think a lot of people think life happens write it yourself, go do the thing you want to do, take a risk, do those things where it's like, this might crash and burn. Look, if it crashes and burn, you'll probably still learn better lessons than if you just played the easy, the easy hand or the easy cards, you know? So I, I say, take some risk, get it, you know, get out of your comfort zone and go try something that you, you might want to do. You're definitely right on like five years ago. Most people have dreams and things that they've been wanting to do for a long time. And the bulk of people will never do them. They will never put their chips on the table. And uh, I think if you put your chips and table and crash and burn, it'd still be way better than never playing your game and your hand. And then I think amidst that, you got to find good people to do it with. You know, I mean, anybody asked me, do I miss my time in the military, jumping out of planes, blowing things up, shooting a mile, doing all that stuff? I mean, yeah, it was fun, you know, having access to the assets and all the things we got to do. You know, they make video games about what we do and movies about what we do. I got to live that for real. 
I don't really miss that. I miss the boys. I miss the relationships, those sublime connections of people that you know have your back on a level that very few people ever have and like have the skill set to do it, right? I mean, it's one thing it's like, my boy's got my back. I'm like, well, they're all fat though. So like, I mean, they can't help you that much, you know? So <laughs> I had a bunch of dudes who's like, let's go. You want to get it on, we'll get it on. And so that's a lot of fun to be a part of it. But um, no, it's the relationships. And I, I, I did a post um if you're if you're not on them, I do something once a month that I call my commander's coffee. So it's a video I send out. There's like an email list. Um, at the end of the show, we could talk about it. But I just do a thought, you know, video once a month on current event or leadership topic, something my daughter taught me or something interesting. Uh, one or two of them ago, I, I was writing something and I sent it to my dad, my brother and my bride. And they both put they, they all put really good edits on it and it made it better. That editing process really made it better. And I think finding mentors and finding good people around you to help help you, you could almost think of that as being like they're editors of like who you are, almost editors in your life. And look, I wrote two books and editors gave great suggestions that made them better. I, I wrote it the best I could, but somebody with another set of eyes looked at it and made it better. We, we need to be better about that in our lives. Like I need an editor for my life. You know, I mean, faith and, and God would be a good one. You probably need somebody that can really have a conversation with you and be like, hey, Here's where you're screwing up. Or look, might, might think about it this way, a little bit differently. Um, Accountability. It's, yeah, for sure. it's just, I mean, yeah. iron sharpens iron, you know. So uh, love that, man. Those are all great points. I got to ask you a fun story, though, that Micah told me to bring up about okay. uh, Kit Fox was some conservationist or something like that. He said it's a great story. Um, you know what I'm referring to? I'm trying to remember the, uh, the, the Kit Fox one. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yeah, I totally right, here remember. We go. Yeah, here this we go. is, uh, yeah, I don't know if we should tell this story, but. We don't God, have God to. Bless my, no, no, it's, it, it is funny. We do a lot of our training out on San Clemente Island, one of the Channel Islands off the southern coast of California. So we've got a huge base. If anybody's ever been to Catalina with like, you know, mini golf courses and bars and like mountain bike trails, that's not what San Clemente Island is. It's like the land of the lost out there. The only thing that lives out there are like seabirds, big, big sharks off the coast, sea lions. And there's these kit foxes, these little foxes that live out on that island. Well, of course, it's California, so there's like an environmentalist group that like lives out on that island to protect the kit foxes. Look, we're dropping bombs, blowing things up, doing high explosives, all these different live fire mission sets out there. And anytime you run an evolution on a military base in California, an environmentalist or, or you know, um, park ranger or someone will come up and will give you a speech on how not to hurt the local wildlife, which we, of course, don't try and do. At the same time, we got to do our job. So we do this big planning for a major mission we're going to do out on that island and here comes this uh you know whoever the the conservation representative that comes out for the island comes out and i say this with utter respect but you can if you can just envision something out of central casting of like a california berkeley graduate student that you know comes out to try and give all these big bad wolves a speech about not hurting the kit foxes it literally was like a saturday night live skit i mean she just comes out and is dressing everybody down and you guys are always doing this and like i don't think anybody has ever tried to half those kit foxes hang themselves in like a tarp out there they're so uncoordinated but i digress so she gives this whole speech about how if a kit fox does get killed you need to call in on this radio, report immediately. We'll come out and do the investigation. I literally told all my guys before they showed up, I'm like, dude, nobody make jokes. Nobody make tree hugger jokes. Nobody make Berkeley jokes. Like, of course, I said, but like, don't just be cool. Let her give her speech. We'll carry on. So she finishes her speech. She gives a radio to one of my guys, and she drives out of there in that classic green, like, national forest truck. Oh, yeah. I'm in another room. Not five minutes later, one of my guys comes in with the radio in his hand, and he is crying. He has been laughing so hard. I mean, tears. I've never said, I'm like, what is going on? He's like, dude, I mean, if you didn't believe in God, I believe in God now. I'm like, how's that? He's like, stand by. We got a call on the radio from her four minutes after she left the compound calling for help. So, of course, we drive up there real quick in like our F-350 diesel pickup truck, probably ruining the environment to come up. The scene we came up to cannot be described. She ran over a kit fox with her national forest truck. Oh, no. So, I mean, just gave an ex like speech to like 80 operators on taking care of the fox. She runs over the fox. She's so distraught of killing that fox that she gets out of the truck to try and apparently give it CPR or something like that, does not put the truck in park. As she's like trying to help the fox, the truck rolls back, 
rolls over her ankles and breaks both her ankles. Oh. <laughs> and then she's calling on the radio like, help, help. I'm in, you know, desperate need of, and she was. And of course my guys come up immediately, get her like splinted up, get her over to the like hospital and medevac her out of there. But you're just like, this is a dream scenario of like somebody that just made us look like the big bad wolf and then runs over a kid Fox. I mean, it was all we could do to be like, well, you're reporting the kid Fox kill, right? I mean, not just you yeah. going to the hospital. So it was kind of one of those uh, divine intervention moments that seemed, seemed like a gift. To us. You watch Yellowstone, right? Yeah. Yeah. The one where rip where the uh, park ranger comes yep. up and then oh, she's yeah. on the horse. Cause she has to go see that. Yeah. That's almost that yeah. same. Scenario. It was like that and actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, yeah. yeah. That, that was it. That was it. Yeah. Well, uh, kind of, you know, wrapping up, brother, I wanted to ask, like, what's, uh, well, what are you currently doing? And then, like, what's on the horizon for you for 2024? Yeah. yeah um, and even with, like, your newsletter and the stuff that you do For sure, month, for sure. Yeah, that'd be yeah, great. Yeah, so, so the one I mentioned, if you, my website is RourkeDenver.com, just my first name, last name, all, all one, RourkeDenver.com. I've got a bunch of, uh, you know, content there and things that people can dig into. Uh, at the bottom of that website, you can sign up for what I call my commander's coffee. So it's just an email distro list. No, no pay, nothing. You just put it in there. You'll get one email a month. I don't try and cross your inbox with white noise every Tuesday texts or whatever. One, maybe two emails a month. It's just a concept or something I'm thinking about and, and share it with you. If you like it, pass it on to somebody else. If you don't delete it, won't hurt my feelings. Um, so that's a good way to kind of connect there. Um, I'm not heavy on social media. I'm actually going to try and get more into it in 2024, just because it is such a language that is powerful and pushing content and trying to get, uh, attention to what you do. Um, the base of my pyramid are kind of like the big speaking events for, you know, the corporate America, but I, I, you know, I'll have a small high school call me up and be like, can you come talk to a lacrosse team? And you know, whether they can afford my, my number or not, I usually try and figure out a way to yes, to try and do those ones that I know will move the needle. Um, so that's a way you can connect me as well. And I think this year is going to be an interesting year on, on growing a lot of online content. I, I'm traveling so much right now doing that speaking and it's great, fruitful, and I enjoy it. I am away a lot. I mean, this fall, I, I, you know, I've got a freshman in high school and I miss most of her volleyball games and it's killing me. So I'm trying to build an academy or a bigger online of both um, leadership content, human performance content. And it's going to be exactly the way I do my speeches. I'm not going to kill you with a bunch of diagrams. It's going to be a story, a principle, action, takeaway, and put it in with your team. I'm going to try and price that in a way that people can really get access to it. And I want to grow a tribe right there. So um, staying up on the website in the coming months, it's going to we're going to start metering that out soon and trying to build that part of it. And then, um, yeah, I think 2024, I definitely want to get a couple more events on the, on the calendar, you know, more experiential stuff where people can come, um, maybe get uncomfortable. I'm not going to run a, a sealed diet program. There's plenty of guys that do that. And look, if you're a guy that wants to go do some, you know, seal experience, go do it. I'm sure it's a bunch of fun. I don't want to do that. I, I liked what I did and I want to create some other, uh, avenue. And I'm really actually trying to wrestle with a bit of, of what is next. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to take a big departure into some other, you know, corporate job or something like that, but I'm trying to focus, as you mentioned, I mean, I do think when I talk, I resonate with men and that that's a good connection point. I also, there's something on my heart, a little bit of, of looking at young folks and them not having as many, you know, mentors or archetypes or heroes out there that can really give them a good path and a set of skill sets to get them to a good place. So there's a little bit of a calling right now, maybe to do some something with kids. So I'm 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 working through that right now. Working through it. Yeah. We're writing it down. Yeah. To, yeah. Well, I think that well, Jim this weekend was talking about the whole um, you know, God's children aren't for sale. It's the whole human trafficking, but yeah, the problem that we have in our country with that, just in our country, yeah. like in our backyard, for not sure. just other for places. Sure. Yeah. And you think about even maybe to not that extreme, you just go to a high school. Like I can go to my old or youngest son's high school sure. right now and you meet a few kids and like there's just a no fear, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, but it's also that mentality. And I'm sure you saw this a lot in Iraq. You see the young kids are in the movies where they're running out with the RPGs. Yeah. Like the way that they're raised or maybe not raised, like they don't even value their life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and valuation of life. I think which kind of covers all these things is huge. For and sure, I think sure. with your stories and all that, you definitely are onto something for yeah. sure. No, I appreciate it. We'll see where it goes. So for other than, so social media, you're going to be doing more there, but then yep. just work Yeah. It's the best place to find me. You know, my books are, uh, I've got damn yeah. few and then worth dying for. They're both, you know, find them at Amazon, the audio books. I of course read them. So you'll hear my voice and, and talking through them. They're, they're, I think 
I'll, I'll definitely be starting on another book in 2024. It just is, uh, they don't write themselves. So I definitely got to, you know, have the right, the right methodology and the right, right direction with it. But uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a good year. Yeah. So worth dying for is the book that Rourke signed for me when we went and shot bows together. But I want to put a hunt on your schedule this year. Let's do it, man. We'll, we'll try to We're figure overdue. that out. We're overdue. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. Yeah. Well, I yeah. don't think we've, we haven't hunted together. No. You've, no. you've gone with Jim. No, we've been talking about it a bunch, but we haven't put it together. We need to do it. All right, cool. Well, yep. thanks for coming on, brother. I no, appreciate your you time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, you know, this is going to, or this podcast will come out. It'll be pr the first week of January. Cool. So we'll when it. people are listening to it. So right happy on. new year, everybody. Yeah. And uh, heed some of Rourke's great advice. Yeah, appreciate it. Love you, brother. Yeah, love you too.